Welcome to Crescent Heights Baptist Church. Those of you who are gathered here in the sanctuary and all of you who are online, it is good to be together as the people of God to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, for those who are maybe first time here or joining us for the first time, my name is Tyler. I am uh, the pastor here at Crescent Heights, and um, we are excited to be together as the people of God to worship uh, together. Just a couple of things for those of you who are online. If you do have any troubles, uh, please feel free to text 403 560-2688, and we'll do what we can to help you out. Um, hopefully everything goes smooth and you don't need to use that, but by all means, if you do, please do so. Um, as we have gotten away from in the last couple of years, I want to try uh, something. If, you, if you've been with us for many years, you will recognize this, but we're going to do it in a little bit different format. I would invite you to, at this time, uh, welcome a neighbor. Welcome the person beside you. Give them a, an elbow bump or a, a salute to say welcome, and it is good to be in the presence of God together. Um, we are here as God's people. And afterwards, uh, Trinky will come up and lead us in the call to worship. Pardon? It was really good. Yeah, there was like tons of road closures, but there were no... Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand with us as we praise our Lord and we'll start with our God. Into the 
darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger Lord, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and
Before we sing, turn your eyes, I'd like to read you this. <coughs> this is John 1, uh, verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as one of the Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Isn't that beautiful? God, Jesus became flesh for us because he loves us. And there's nothing that we can do to deserve that. But he gave it out of his grace and out of his love. And somewhere in Isaiah, I can't remember the exact verse, it says, um, the Lord has come and he has made us clean, not for us, but be for him, because he loves us. And we are honored and blessed to be able to be loved by the Lord who created this whole universe. So when we sing, turn your eyes, why don't you just thank him for what he has done, for what Jesus has done, and for what he has bared on the cross for us. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. 
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning, all. It's good to be with you this morning. Please join me in the congregational prayer for this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity this morning that we can come together as your people, as the body of Christ, that we can come and fellowship with one another in times like these where we are separated um, from normal interaction. Thank you that we can be here. And may this um, coming together, may this fellowship this morning, uh, May your Holy Spirit direct it. May we share our needs. May we share our burdens with one another that we can um, intercede for one another, that we can help one another in our journey, in our walk, um, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, this morning we know that there is many that are struggling with health. There is many that's struggling with um, physical health, um, mental health. Father, we know that these times are tough. Um, it is not something like we've had before, um, truly Holy Spirit, come and minister to us and open our eyes as well that we can see those opportunities where we can be the light for this world. We know that we have hope in you, even in times like these, and help us to be able to share that light and that hope to those surrounding us that do not have that, those going through difficult situations. Father, we thank you um, um, for those that are already covering. We think of uh, Pastor John uh, from Guthrie. Uh, with these recent health issues, we come and ask that you would lead him as well with his recovery, that you would be um, guiding him in a time of rest as well and recovery for his physical body. We think of um, Sonny's friend's son, Aiden, this morning. Father, that you would be with him in his recovery process as well. Um, help him uh, mentally, help him physically. May you just be him, give him people surrounding him um, to be able to take him through this process as well. Uh, Father, we come and ask of Hudson this morning, uh, where he's struggling with fever up and down. Father, we come and ask that you place your hand of healing, Jesus, on his body as well. We come and ask that you be with him in this process, that you would give them ability to still shine his light um, amidst all of this. Um, Father, we, we come and ask that you would truly guide us, in, once again, in times like these, where there seems there is so much division. Uh, you, We know that as your body, as the at the church, you've called us to not be partial, not to be um, judging one another. Um, Father, we know that there are so many different opinions. We know that there's so many, so many different viewpoints um, in life, but you've still called us to not be divisive, um, not be uh, partial to one another. Help us to do that in difficult times. Uh, we might fail in this instance, uh, Father, but truly come and show us through your Holy Spirit the way that we ought to live, that you've called us to live in your kingdom. Amen. <coughs> okay, this morning, um, this is going to be the scripture reading for the communion section, and afterwards we're going to go into prayer again, and then I'm going to give us some time to reflect before we head into communion, just to make sure we align our hearts with Jesus Christ before we go to the communion table. So the scripture reading for communion is 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34a. It reads as follows. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt that there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for you eat as you go ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Do you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, 
After supper, he took his cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in the remembrance of me. For whoever you eat, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in any unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with this world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, this may not result in judgment. Please join me in prayer, and then I'll facilitate um, some time for reflection before we come to the table. Thank you, Jesus, that we can come before you this morning, before this table of remembrance of what you've done, your act of love, when you sacrificed your body and when you sacrificed your blood. We know that we are sinful beings. We know that um, sin has removed us from fellowship with the Father. And through your blood, Jesus Christ, we can be united with the Father. We know that you have given us this opportunity to be reunited with the Father, that we can be deemed holy, that we can be deemed um, godly, that we can be deemed worthy of being in his presence, being able to do your mission that you've called us to do. So when we come in remembrance um, of these emblems this morning that we, we have just read that you've said that we should come and examine our hearts, Holy Spirit, we come and ask that you would help us with this this morning, that we can examine our hearts before we come and enjoy um, these elements of your body and your blood, that we can truly see what's wrong in our hearts, that we can correct them and come and repent before you this morning, Father, that we can be deemed holy through the blood of Jesus before we come to your presence. May you lead us, Holy Spirit, in this time of reflection. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can come in your presence, that we can come be with you through the blood of Jesus Christ. May you lead us in our daily lives. May we be aligned with your kingdom as we are washed clean with the blood of Jesus Christ and that we live in the fullness of what that means for us, that we are hope for this world, that we are light and salt for this world. May we leave this place this afternoon with a mindset that you have washed us clean, Jesus that you give us the opportunity to go out and live to the fullest and not be um, cast down by the things surrounding us in this world. We thank you for that. Amen. Uh, music team for leading us, preparing our hearts this morning as we gather around this table. Um, we're doing communion at the beginning of the service instead of at the end this morning. Um, again, it's not a prescription as to when we do it, but we're called to do it. We're called to gather as one body around this table. 
because this table is a place of reorientation. As we travel uh, throughout our days and our weeks, we are bombarded by ideas, thoughts, opportunities, pitfalls. And this table is an opportunity to gather once again and to remember who we are called to be and why we are called to be. We're called to remember who it was that has given us life, who it was that has laid his life down that we might have it to the full. And so this table that we gather around uh, is not Crescent's table. It's not, uh, we're not, nobody owns this opportunity. This is an opportunity for us as those who know Christ to come together, to come before him, to learn from him, to say once again, Jesus, I need your help. I thank you for your gift of life. And I am going to work within all the gifts and abilities you've given me to go out and proclaim that you are coming back again that things will be restored, that death will have no power, that sin will be fully washed away. And so as we gather around this table, we partake in this uh, wafer and this juice together, which we call, I mean, in in Baptist circles, we call these things um, symbols, but there's something more in them than just a symbol. Despite whatever the material is, this is, there's something that's As we partake in it together, we are partaking of it as one body in Christ. This isn't his flesh as in cells and skin. This is his flesh as in the life he laid down for you and for me. This is the remembrance, the calling, the invitation to live as you've been created to live, fully and completely in the presence of God. And so as we take the wafer and as we take the juice We recognize Christ's sacrifice for us and the new covenant in which we enter into, the covenant that we could never attain on our own, the gift of life that we cannot earn, the grace and the blessing through his sacrificial love that is given to you and it's given to me. We are his body. Let's partake together in the bread and the juice, the flesh and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's eat together. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have commanded us, you have called us, you have invited us around this table together as your people. We pray, Lord, that as often as we do this together, we would remember that we are not just a people gathered, we are not a community group, we are not just people who showed up at the same time in the same place on a particular day, but we are your body, your messengers, your heralds, your disciples called to make disciples. And so as we reorient our lives once again around this table to recognize you as Lord and Savior, we thank you for the blessing that we can do this together in peace and that we can go out from this place as one body to proclaim once again that the kingdom of God has come and that you, Jesus, are King. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for the gift of grace. We thank you for life eternal. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This time I'm going to invite Laurel to come share with us the scripture reading for this morning. Good morning. I'm reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 22 to 32. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King Davis said, King David said this about him, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. 
No wonder my heart is glad, and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead, or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David looking, David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Well, as I said at the beginning of this series on the Apostles' Creed, um, there's a few controversial points, and we come to our first this morning. Um, Jesus went to hell, and I was going to, I was joking with the, the team as we were praying downstairs earlier, that I was going to start the sermon with go to hell, and then we would go from there, um, which would not work well. It's not exactly what was going on here. It's not what the creed proclaims, and it's surely not what Peter was sharing with the crowd as he was proclaiming. Jesus as Messiah. But there is this issue that we face. Jesus went to hell. What does that mean? What is it? Why do we have such challenge with it? What theologically is behind it? Or maybe it's a language issue that we're struggling with. When I think of my own theology and the work that I've done in theology throughout the years, hell and the doctrine of hell and understanding of hell is probably my weakest link because it's uncomfortable. I don't like talking about it. I feel like, and you know, you hear the questions, how could a loving God send people to hell? How is it that hell exists if God created his world and we are his creation? How could there be this place, this uh, separation from God? And so for me, it's, it's been a bit of a struggle working through what does this phrase mean and, or what does this phrase mean and what does it mean for us and why is it important that it's in there that's lasted the test of time? in terms of the, the creed itself. But it seems, you know, even if we step back from hell itself and we just talk about death, I begin to realize, and culturally we begin to realize, that we as a people have a struggle even with death. And it's probably our struggle with death that makes it a struggle, that makes the concept of hell and what's going on here a struggle as well. Culturally, we are afraid of death. We do everything in our power both in the church and without, or outside of the church, to avoid death. None of us, especially in our earlier years, want to die. We cling to it. And those who don't, or we cling to life, and those who don't cling to life, we raise an eyebrow at. We're concerned for. That if someone says, I just want to die, we ask, what's going on? What's wrong? But then when we read the Scriptures we see something else happening. When you read the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, death doesn't seem to be an issue, but hell also seems to be present. There was something that was driving Paul in his ministry activity, in his willingness to proclaim the gospel and to suffer for the cause of Christ, that was neither afraid of death nor welcomed it. Paul lived in full confidence of the life that God was leading him in. And he quotes Hosea saying, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? When he's writing to the Philippians, he says to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whether I'm here or whether I'm gone, whether I'm alive or whether I'm dead, it just doesn't matter because God is in control. That there is life that I am living right now. For Paul, death seemed irrelevant. And I think, I believe, I understand, and I read the scriptures that the reason death seemed irrelevant is because of this line that we come to here in the creed. Jesus descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. And so in order to kick the controversy off to the side a little bit, 
we have to recognize the language that's being used there. The, the word uh, hell that we've, or that we've translated hell is the same word that Paul uses or Peter uses when he's referring to the fellow Israelites in Acts chapter 2 that Laurel just read for us. And it's not the hell that we envisioned that was made very famous in Dante's Inferno, a piece of literature that's been around for multi-hundreds of years that depicted this descent into hell and these ghouls and goblins and difficult situations. That's not the word that Paul or Peter is referring to. That's not the word of the creed. The word that we get translated into hell here is the word Hades, the place of the dead. Those who die, who no longer have breath within them, whose brain function has not happened anymore, it's the place that the Israelites realized or believed people went to, a place where life did not exist. And so what we're affirming in the creed, what's been affirmed for hundreds of years, is that Jesus did in fact die. He was not put on, he wasn't a Romeo and Juliet, you know, partial death, you know, medication, temporary death situation. What we were affirming in the creed, what Peter affirmed to his fellow Israelites, what Paul understood and drove and his confidence in life as he lived it was that Jesus died. There's no gospel if Jesus doesn't die. He had to take on death. We see that in the garden. When Jesus goes, he calls the three disciples, you know, his three trusty friends who left him out on his own time and time again. He takes Peter, James, and John, they go into the garden and he says, sit here and pray while I go over there and pray. And they continue to fall asleep. But the prayer that Jesus prayed is, Father, take this cup from me. The cup that Jesus is referring to was the cup of wrath. The cup of God's um, attack on sin. That's the cup that Jesus was inviting into. And in order for him to take that cup and that he was willing to take the cup that the Father had given him to drink, in order for him to take that, he had to die. He had to bury sin once and for all. And so when we affirm in the creed that Jesus went to hell, we were affirming, we're recognizing that moment, that season that he was anticipating in the garden when he said, take this cup from me, but not my will but yours. Take this cup of wrath from me. I don't want to experience this sin. I don't want to take this upon my shoulder from an enjoyment perspective, an interesting endeavor thing. No, Jesus is saying, if there's another way, take this wrath from me and solve the problem, but not my will. Yours be done. And so when we read in the creed, Jesus went to hell, we're recognizing Jesus' willingness to take that cup of wrath to lay down his life completely, that he, he did in fact offer himself as a living sacrifice. And I think if we can get that into our bones as Paul did and as Peter and some of the other disciples did, if we can understand that really what that means, that that belief becomes <clears throat> a part of who we are, we now no longer have to fear death. We no longer have to be afraid of whether we live or we die. We can be fully committed to the life that Jesus has called us to, the mission that he's called us to. We don't have to fear loss of income, identity, breath, house, family. When we fully understand that Jesus took on our sin, that he laid his life willingly for you and for me, when that moves within our bones, it beats within our heart, it resounds within our mind, when, it, when we fully grasp that belief, we can say as Paul did, death, oh, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? You see, Paul lived in, Peter lived in, James lived in a freedom that so few of us actually live in. They were completely free in the confines and the difficulties and the struggles of their day, which was in many ways not unlike ours. They were free to live as Christ had called them to, to proclaim the gospel. Again, you hear it when Paul says, I've had it all and I've had nothing. I've been in prison and I've had no concerns about physical freedom. I've eaten really well and I've gone without food. I've been on a shipwreck. I've been beaten. Paul said, whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is we come to know the living God. That living God 
Jesus who willingly went to death, who laid down his life. And so as we read through the creed, as we come to this third clause, we believe in God the Father who created all things, who holds complete power in his hand, who is omniscient, omnipotent, and all those other fancy words, who's both transcendent, he's apart from creation, and also very imminent, he walked amongst us, he hears us, he sees us, he desires to know us. When we affirm that Jesus was in fact born, he came into life just like you and I did. He faced sin just like you and I did, or temptation just like you and I did. And he laid down his life in complete confidence of the Father and what he was doing. When we really believe that and practice that and live that out moment by moment, day by day, we can stand with Peter and say, look, David recognize that someone was going to come and sit on his throne whose kingdom will not fail. And you and I are living in that moment right now. We're living right now where the king is on his throne and through us, he desires for us to live free. It's not the provincial government or the civic government or the federal government or if you're conspiracy theorist, the one world government. It's none of those that are in control. Jesus sits on his throne. And that same king was the one who in the garden prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Take this cup of wrath from me, but I will willingly take it because I love this people. I desire for them to know you because to know the Father is to live completely free. And so today as we affirm around this table, as we gather together both here and online, as we read Scripture together, as we encourage one another, as we correct and uh, rebuke one another, as we challenge each other to live the way of Jesus, we are practicing the trust that Jesus, in the phrase of the Apostles' Creed, went to the dead. But he didn't just stay there. He went to the dead and he was raised back on the third day. His glory burst forth. He defeated death. He burst open the gates that all who trust in him, that all who know him, that all who walk in his ways will live eternally. And so we have to start with and understand that that Jesus did die. But we have to live even more knowing that he rose again. That he is the Son of God, Savior of the world, but he's also the friend that walked amongst us. He's the one that loves you and loves me more than we can comprehend. And so we need to work on our theology of hell. Not to figure it out in terms of, you know, what does the devil look like or how many layers to hell are there or any of those kinds of things. But we need to work on our theology of hell to recognize that God did in fact die. That God did in fact give up his life. And when that seeps into our bones, knowing that he has resurrected again, you and I can also be free. We can be free to love, free to be generous, free to show hospitality, free to be kind, gracious, patient, self-controlled. In the last few weeks, I've been struggling with those things. I've been, I haven't been free. I've been angry at times. I've been apathetic at times. I have been going through the motions at times. And I, I've gone to my doctor and met with a counselor on Thursday and Angie and I continue to talk through things. Our leadership has surrounded me and we've talked through things. And There's nothing that I can pinpoint. There's no specific thing, but I know this. As we gathered this morning, as the team led us in music, as bears led us in prayer, as Laurel read the scriptures, there was something going on. The work of God is breaking through some of that lack of freedom. For the first time in a long time, I had tears as we sang. As we gathered around this table, just, there was something more that was saying, hey, no, no, this is real, what we do. And I have no doubt that as the prayers of the people It's a study of the word. 
and the recognition that Jesus did die for me. That Jesus did lay his life down for me. That he has laid his life down for you. And so I would invite you, wherever you're at, whatever you're struggling with, whatever challenges you face, work on your theology of hell. Again, not that it, the devil with horns or pitchfork or any of those kinds of things. But what does it mean to live daily that Jesus died for you? That you don't have to be bound up in the struggles of today. Because whether you live or you die, God is on his throne. Whether you have lots of money in the bank or very little, God is on his throne. Whether your neighbor annoys you or is gracious to you, God is on his throne and we are free then to live as his people. To love fully and to share graciously. Many people avoid death, are afraid of death, and as a result, they don't fully live because anxiety and fear binds them up. Others live carefree. They enjoy this life because they haven't contemplated what exists on the next side of death or have just written it off as something that doesn't exist. But the Apostles' Creed affirms for us that God is Father, that He has created each one of us, that His Son has entered into the world the same way you and I have, that He walked amongst us, and that this same Son, this same God, has taken on death, has drunk, drank, and consumed the cup of wrath, that you and I might live free today. And so we embrace the concept of hell, of death, that Jesus died for you, in order that you might live free today, tomorrow, and through all eternity. Let's praise him through prayer today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the life that you lived for entering into it, for teaching, for guiding, for sharing. But we thank you, Lord, that you interceded for us, that you went to the garden to come before the Father and you were willing to take the cup of wrath, to understand what sin, how much power sin has to separate us from the Father, and you said you will take it on, that you will drink it which meant that you would be separated from life because you would have to enter the place of the dead. And so we praise you and we give thanks. We repent where we have tried to earn our salvation, where we've tried to do it on our own, to think our way through. Holy Spirit, move within us, soften our hearts, give us, us eyes to see and ears to hear, to live in the freedom that came at the cost of God's Son's sacrifice to live knowing that you, Jesus, are on the throne as we will examine throughout the rest of the creed. And that no matter what happens here, it will all be okay. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the opportunity to participate in your resurrection, to proclaim your gospel, to demonstrate new life, a life of community knitted together by the Spirit and your love. And so we give you praise today. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the gift of life that was seen so clearly by the disciples as you ro rose again on the third day. We here believe that Jesus, you descended to the place of the dead and on the third day you rose again. And for that, we give you praise. Amen. Why don't you stand and uh, let's give praise to the Lord in our last song, Mighty to Save.
My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the Feel free to take a seat uh, for a moment if you like. Just a few announcements, and I uh, want to pray for the offering and explain uh, what we have going on here. Um, for, well, let's do this first. Uh, in he- these bags, these bags are for your neighbors. Um, in these bags, I'm going to need to read it from the front. No, I don't have the list on it. In here are daffodil, two daffodil bulbs, is that correct? There are two daffodil bulbs in here. And it's an invitation, three daffodil bulbs. Can I get four? Is there four daffodil bulbs? Uh, There's three daffodil bulbs in here. Uh, You are invited to take as many as, before they're all gone, um, to give to your neighbors. An invitation. There's uh, information on how to plant daffodils on the back or on this side. There's a, a good quote here from Lamentations on the front and from Lady Bird Johnson. And inside is a newsletter uh, that's actually crumpled up because it can be buried with the daffodils. Uh, it'll compost. But on it is um, information about what's upcoming here at Crescent. So different ministry opportunities, and, and we'll get to some of those in the announcements, but that's in there. So it's an invitation you can give to your neighbor, uh, as well as information about what's going on ministry-wise within the church to plant new life in your neighborhoods. And so we would invite you. We're going to pray together over these, um, as well as please come take them and share them with your neighbors and uh, again, just a great opportunity, you know, like Halloween, we love Halloween in our family because we get to go talk to our neighbors and invade their houses and it's perfectly socially acceptable. Um, this is another opportunity to go to your neighbor and say, hey, uh, you know, we've been neighbors for so long or whatever else and, and we just want to bless you and thank you. Uh, here's a gift, uh, or not a gift, but uh, just bringing new life into our community. And so please, uh, after the service, come and take some of these that we might share them throughout Calgary as we give them to our neighbors. Um, and so let's pray uh, over these as we also pray for uh, the offering. Uh, offering, as always, is a box here and online. You can donate online. And it's an opportunity. The offering is not a, hey, this is something I need to do or should do because someone's looking down on me or is going to check off whether I offered or not. Offering is a means of worship. It's a means of participating in the kingdom by the, the, the money that gets used for all the things that we do here in the church but it's also an act of worship and a, and a spiritual practice of being generous. And so with that, let's, uh, we're going to pray over these bags as well as the offering and, uh, that we will receive today and this week. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to worship you here in this place online as we gather together as the church. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us and the offering that is going to be given. That we pray, Lord, that you would bless it, that it would be multiplied to meet the need that you have called us to uh, engage in as we make disciples and care for those in need. We pray, Lord, over these bags and the daffodils within, the message of Christ, the hope of salvation that they are, an opportunity to be gracious and caring and and engage and meet our neighbors. We pray, Lord, that they wouldn't just bloom flowers, but they would bloom relationships amongst neighbors and ultimately with you. And so we pray a special blessing upon these. Anoint these, Lord, that they may be an offering to our communities, that we might communicate the love of Jesus who lived, who died, and who rose again, that we might have life in the full. Thank you for today and for the blessing and the offering that we bring to you this morning. Amen. Just a few announcements of things that are upcoming. Um, On Tuesday, as always, we are meeting for prayer via Zoom. Uh, The information, or uh, you can email me. An email goes out. If you're not on an email list, we invite you to do that, but also on the website, Uh, there's a link there you can click to say, hey, send me information about the Zoom meeting that we gather and pray together. Um, And then on Wednesdays, um, we've got the Bible study, the women's Bible study that's ongoing. They're following the the Apostles' Creed as well, 620 here on Wednesday morning if you want more information. Uh, 
Uh, no, six, not 6.20 in the morning. That would, be, that would be very Korean Presbyterian church. Um, 6.20 in the evening here on Wednesdays. Thank you, Lisa. And if you do have any questions, please talk to Lisa or Leona. Uh, they're leading that and we'll be happy to share more information. Um, starting October 15th, junior high, senior high, and college students are going to be meeting together. Um, fr- the kickoff is on Friday, October 15th here at the church, 7 till 9. And so that's an opportunity for the youth to gather. Six. Oh, did you change that? Okay, Noel changed things on me. I read seven. My memory's not too bad. I remembered seven, and that's the wrong number. So six till nine, Wednesday, October 15th, uh, here at the church. And, sorry, you say more? What the heck did I say? Whew. It's on the slide. Friday, October 15th, six till nine, junior high, senior high, and college. Uh, and it's actually part of a, a bigger kickoff that's happening with an event um, that's going to be Canada-wide. Um, and so that is upcoming. Kids Sunday School is starting the following Sunday. So Sunday, October 17th, Kids Sunday School is starting. It's a whole new revamp program that Natalie and the team has put together. It's going to be awesome. Um, it's going to have a very much day camp feel in terms of participation and engagement and completeness. So that's going to be fantastic. That's October 17th. And then, um, do you, you want to come? You just come up here. Oh, Yes, yeah, so Noelle is telling me, for those of you online, you don't hear it, but she's talking in the sanctuary to let me know, and, and this is fully accurate, just to make sure to register. So we make, for kids, register so we know how many to expect and make sure that everything is in place to follow all COVID guidelines and all those kinds of things. So uh, that is on the website. And then uh, Sunday mornings, of course, we gather here for prayer at 945. Um, by all means, come next Sunday and join together in prayer. And finally, um, following this service, uh, when you and long pastors at Blessed, we're going to have an ordination service here. So um, if you're able to come and participate in that, that's fantastic. Um, that it's been a long time coming. This is actually uh, Blessed Church's first back-in-person gathering. Um, they've, they've been meeting up in the gym as we've been gathering here in the sanctuary. And uh, we're going to do an ordination service. The pastors of 1212 come, come and surround Long and Wenyu uh, to ordain them to gospel ministry. And that's going to happen about 12 o'clock, at 12 or 1230, um, following our service. All right, I think that's all the stuff I can mess up for one morning in terms of announcements. Let's stand together and close with the benediction. Lord God, you have called us into this place, both physically present and online. We are one body united by your spirit, and we give you praise. We ask that as we go from this place, may the love of you, Father, the grace of you, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the fellowship of you, Spirit, be with us, guiding us, leading us to proclaim that the kingdom has come and that the king's name is Jesus. We thank you for the gift of life. Now, as the people of God, go from this place with his blessing that you might bless those around you. Amen. Thank you once again for joining together as God's people. Have a fantastic week.